to do. And so let me read a, a couple of scriptures. Yes, what are you talking? Like your red shoes. Uh, we're going to, uh, let, me, let me just uh, uh, read you a couple of scriptures and then we'll get into this baby dedication this morning. It's a great honor, a great honor to dedicate your babies to stand. And God bless the wee one to you. And we just take this morning to hold him up. Uh, little Jamie, want to hold him up and give him, dedicate his life back to the Lord. The Bible says in Mark chapter 10 and verse 13, it says, And they brought the young children to him, this is to the Lord Jesus, that he should touch them. He wanted them to come and he wanted them, they, they ran up to him and said, touch my child, touch my child. And uh, Laura and I knows what that's like. It doesn't happen so much in this country, but when you go to other Asian or African countries, they really want their children blessed. Uh, and we have long prayer lines and healing lines and all types of stuff. And, and, and especially in the Asian churches, nobody leaves until their children's been blessed. And they bring the children up and they want you just to lay hands on the child for the blessing. And that must have been taken from here because they brought their young children to Jesus that he would touch them. Now his disciples rebuked those that brought them, but Jesus saw that and he was much displeased. And he said unto them, now listen, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for such is the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. Then he took them up in his arms, and he put his hands on them, and he blessed them. And because we take our, our leaders from the Word of God, this is where we take our lead in life for what we're going to do this morning. We're going to take her up, take him up in our arms, and we're going to speak and prophesy and bless, put a blessing over his life. The Bible says in Psalm uh, 121, verse 1, Except the Lord build the house, then they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It's a vain thing to rise up early, to sit up late, and to eat the bread of sorrows. And he's just simply talking about sitting up all night worrying. It doesn't help. So, so he, he gives his beloved sleep. He said, Lo, the children are the heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows is in the hand of a mighty man. This is you, Killian. As the, ha as the arrows is in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. Happy is the man that has a quiver full of them. He shall not be ashamed and he shall speak with his enemies and again. He shall not be ashamed. A quiver. They reckon a quiver full is about five to six hours. So, you have a wee bit to go yet. A wee bit to go. All right, now here's my favorite, favorite passage of Scripture in building a picture of why we do this and what we're about to do. Jeremiah 1 verse 5. It says, God said this to, to humanity. He says, before I formed you. And he's talking to Jamie now. So it's what God said, before I formed you in the belly, he said, Jamie, I knew you. And before you ever come out of your mother's womb, I had already separated you for a, in his case, it was Jeremiah's, was ordained to be a prophet to the nations. But we could just as easy say, set apart for your purpose in this lifetime. And because of that one scripture, we know now, we know, we see Jamie as a little baby. But God already sees him as a full-grown man with a destiny and a purpose and a plan. You've got to raise him up. You've got to bring him up to that. But if God knows him, then God knows why he's here, knows his purpose, knows his plan. So it makes it easy then for to prophesy somebody's future even when they're a child. I remember when I first started prophesying. And people can handle when I prophesy prayer lines over an adult. But when I started to prophesy over children, people used to say, how could you do that? Sure, he's only a wee kid. Well, exactly, the Bible says that before he ever got here, God already knew who he would be and what he was already called to be. We just didn't know them things when we were young, so nobody told us. So I have an honor and a privilege as a prophetic ministry of speaking over children's lives and the ability to tell them what their future holds. And I always say that's a great blessing to your parents because if you know what direction your children's going in, then when it comes to school, you can point them in that direction. And you can see it. I mean, I've prophesied over my own children, over grandchildren, and even now in some of the grandchildren, they'll come, their, their my daughters will come and say to me, look at this, here's, here's Here's his life and he's doing this. But you prophesied that at his dedication that he would go down this way. And you can see the traits then begin to come out. And we're going to do that with little Jamie this morning. And the final scripture before we actually get into the dedication this morning is in Luke chapter 2 and verse 40. And it says, and the child grew. 
Well, that's what we want. We want the child to grow. We want the child to be healthy. And the, and the Bible says in the, in the authorized version, it says, and he waxed strong in spirit. Now, that's what we want for him. We want him to be a strong man in his spirit. And the Bible says he was filled with wisdom. We want that too. Filled with wisdom. And then especially this, and the grace of God was upon him. Above all things, we desire and require the grace of God to come upon our families. Where would it be if it wasn't for the grace of Almighty God? So I'm coming down your way, and you're going to join me. Laura, will you just join me this morning? I need you to join me up here. Now, here's where we'll do this. I'll let you stand here looking this way so that they can see the smile on your face. And That's right. Just stand right there and look good as usual. That's right. Now, it is a privilege and an honor to stand with you and your family and your friends this morning that has come to the house of the Lord. Uh, the greatest honor, of course, uh, for the little ones that they don't know it yet is but that you're believers because they're being brought up in a privileged household, a house that already knows the Lord and trusts the Lord and, and can see God doing great things. And, of course, on this occasion, your family and friends just came to witness it. And I need to remind you that this is not what normal people would call a, the christening. Uh, we, don't, we don't refer to that at all. We call this a dedication because we realize that God granted you this little one into your house to be a tremendous blessing. But we understand that we must give him back uh, to the Lord at this morning. They ask the Lord to bless the little one that has come upon you. And of course, in, in the, in the uh, dedication, it simply means we put the onus back onto you two that you in front of the congregation, in front of the pastors and the leaders will take a vow to say that you will uh, watch over the little one and you'll bring him up in the ways of the Lord also. So, let's, uh, <clears throat> he's doing really well, absolutely. Uh, Killian and Anne, in presenting little Jamie to the Lord, do you promise by precept and example to instruct your child and bring Jamie up in the ways of the Lord? Yes. Did you hear that? Do you promise to walk with him and to help him and to watch over him all the days of his life? We do. <laughs> ah, that's better, that's better. Someone was looking, waiting on the wee do and it didn't come there. Did. Laura, is there any chance that you could take the wee one on your arms right now? Yeah. We want to pray right now for health and strength. Hey, he's fallen asleep already health and strength and blessing in regard to this little mate, this little champion of tomorrow. We believe, Jamie, you're going to be a precious, precious little person in the, in the Killian and Anne's household, in the Freel household. So, Jimmy Freel, no middle name. Jimmy Freel, in the presence of the pastors and the elders and the members of this church, we present you young man, to the Lord, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We pronounce the blessing of the Lord upon you, from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, for your health, for strength, for inner strength, for your growth, for your well-being, that this little one's mind would be alert, that his intellect will be enhanced. We pray now and believe according to the scriptures for wisdom and especially for spiritual development. We believe for his handsomeness, his beauty, his gentleness, integrity, and a caring attitude. But we also believe that he will gain success in every area of his life. We believe in his areas of friendships. He'll have many. He'll be a loyal, loyal friend. We believe also in his career, his career that you have already marked out for him, Lord. We believe that also that he one day too will be a true servant of the Lord Jesus Christ and that he will experience the hand of the Lord upon his life, every day of his life. And eventually we believe that his days will be long and fruitful, that the hand of God will be seen in his life throughout his lifetime. In Jesus' name, and seeking uh, the life, the destiny of little Jamie. And I didn't have to wait too long. I stood before the Lord in my office and I said, Who is he? Who will he be? And immediately the Lord spoke. He said, He's a master builder. A master builder is not just your 
run-of-the-mill painter and decorator. He's not the run-of-the-mill boy that puts a roof on your house. A master builder who's one who knows how to do it with excellence. A master builder never works for himself. He has to learn that, but he never works for himself. He owns his own with a troop of, with a troop of people working for him. A master builder. I said, thank you, I have it. He said, no, you haven't got it all. He said he's a master builder. He'll be master builder in this land, in this nation. He'll be known with his construction industry in this nation for the things he'd build and construct and know his name on the signs. But that's not all. There's another part of him will have a deep, deep desire to help those in third world countries who doesn't have the schoolhouse, who doesn't have the hospitals, who doesn't have the, the, the running water, and Jamie's heart will always be for third world countries that the money he earns, a major part of it will go and take him at times to oversee and to construct buildings in other nations that will help those that can't help themselves. God has privileged you with a man that's going to work hard with them hands. They'll be big hands. They'll be strong hands. But so will his heart. He'll have a big heart. He'll have a strong heart a heart for the community, and a heart for the people. It'll be like this, wherever he sees a need, that Jimmy will be the first to hand out and help it. Now, you don't wait till he's 25 to see this. You'll see it in the school days, and he'll come up and say, Mommy, give me another coin. Mommy, give me more. I need 50 people because I saw my friend has no lunch every day, and I want to give him mine. You'll see a generous young man here, a blessed one, from the house of the Lord. Thank you this morning, my Father, for just, thank you for the delivery. Thank you for the birth. Thank you for the ability for Anne and Killian just to conceive and then to carry the little one, but to produce such a fine young man this morning. We are blessed just by seeing him. We thank you this morning for this young couple. Who knows? Maybe this will not be them all. Maybe there will be more. This will do right now to practice with. <laughs> but we thank you, Father, for all that you said in this little one. We thank you for your house and your new house. Thank you for the blessing. You've already seen God open the lid and pour in the blessings. Don't stop there. It hasn't stopped. God has so much more for to give, for the blessing to do. He wants you to see. He's got places for you to go and things for you to do. We thank you this morning for this short, brief, but intense dedication of Jamie Friel this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just appreciate this young family this morning. <laughs> well, that one said quiet. That one said quiet. We have beads pulled off Laura's neck. <laughs> we have had major crying interruptions. But that one's good. Maybe you kept them up all night, did you? Maybe he kept you up all night. It's more like, more like the deal. Absolutely. So you said, man, I've not, I've, we never had our baby dedicated. Hey, the meeting is not over yet. <laughs> we go across, when we go across the conferences in England, a lot of times they do uh, Asian churches and African churches in there. And you know, they, when they ask you to come as a conference speaker, they always say this to me. They say, we've got babies for you to dedicate. And I say, well, you know, you're the, you're the pastor. You dedicate them. They say, no, it's not the same. It's not the same. And so when we go to these places, we usually end up doing conferences and have to run somewhere else to marry a couple and have to go over here to bed. They line up their babies for you to dedicate because you know you're going to prophesy over their babies. Well, I just wish, I just wish uh, that when, when our kids was young that, that uh, we would have had somebody there to do it for us. It, it, it doesn't make them any cuter or nicer and it doesn't make them be any smarter at school. But if you know the direction they're going in, absolutely. If you know the direction they're going in, it really, really helps when you're trying to steer them through college, steer them through schools in the days and the years to come. Uh, now that I've got you in here this morning, look at somebody say, you're looking good. I, I need to share something this morning. Uh, and this is really, uh, uh, from the beginning of the year, I've been talking on a uh, uh, subject on destiny, uh, and it's taken, it's taken me all this while to get this far with it. And uh, we, I don't even know if I have any CDs left because we, we were all over the place and uh, CDs were going like hotcakes. 
But uh, if, you, if you require the set of them, I'm sure we can get them posted down to you if you, if you, you don't regularly come to this church. Of course, we're up on YouTube and you can watch it there. But it's imperative that you vital that you understand you're not a mistake. It's necessary that you understand you're not an accident. It's absolutely necessary, no matter what state or what condition you are in life, you've got to understand this, that before you ever arrived here, as we said this morning over Jimmy, God already knew you. God already had a purpose. In fact, when we looked into the Scriptures, we already looked at this, and the Bible said when He formed you, when He created you, it means when He designed you, then He formed you. That's when He put all the little extras on you that you would need for this lifetime, and then He said He made you. That's when you were released to be here with all the goods. But He said in the beginning, whenever He created you, the word created simply means designed with a purpose in mind. So before God ever made you, before you ever were like you are right now, God already saw a problem. He already saw something in your future, not your future, but somebody else's life. And he said, that needs to be fixed. So I'll build one of these to fix this in the generations to come. So you're not here just to warm a seat, to warm a pew in life, but you're actually here to do something awesome in your lifetime. You came equipped, some of you came equipped with a voice because there's somebody here, they needed a lullaby, some of them, they needed singing hands and really enhances you, opens up your spirit. So some people have gifted and talents and abilities to sing that can raise the roof and can create an atmosphere for the spirit of God to come in. Some people is an anointed and gift to teach or to share, to communicate the gospel. Listen, to, preaching and singing is not the only things that God meant, meant people for. He needs doctors, lawyers, psychiatrists, joiners master builders. He needs it all to make a planet work. But I may tell you someone, but people put us, I've always said this, if you don't find out who you are, if you don't find out who God made you to be, I guarantee you somebody else will tell you who you are. And they'll push you through to be a doctor when you always wanted to be a nurse. And they'll push you through as a school teacher when you wanted to be a joiner. Because somebody's always trying to fit you into the slot. But what do they know? What are they? They don't know who you are because they didn't create you. So you've got to go back to your creator and ask God, who am I? Who am I? And then it's in his, the ball's in his court. And I tell you, we've found ways and helped you for the last eight weeks that you can begin to hear from God. So it's got to begin to talk to you, put vision and dreams on the inside of you about your destiny, purpose, and plans. And so it brings us to this morning, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offshoot on this in another direction this morning. I'll probably run through this for another couple of weeks. And this one's vital to where we're going. The last stuff was all about your destiny purposes and, and the real who you are. This one, this one, once you find that out, this one is absolutely necessary. I want to talk to you this morning about character. Everybody shout character. Now, I know in Northern Ireland we use this term, man, he's a real character. Now, we're usually talking about some joker. <laughs> we're usually talking about somebody that's sat far off the wall. You, you, you want to have a laugh at what he's doing, but you really don't want to sit with him too long. I, 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 he's a real character. He's usually a con artist. But I mean, he's a real character, but that's not what this word character is about. No, no, no. It just, it, you've got to understand it too, because if, if you don't understand it, you can find your destiny, you can head towards it, but it's this thing called character. It is your character that will get you there, and it will help you stay there when you get there. Character is one of those things that takes a lifetime to build, but you can lose it overnight. And all you've got to do is dent your character several times and people won't trust you anymore. The definition of uh, character is very simple. It's a mental and moral excellence, qualities distinctive to the individual. So we all got different characters. But the Bible does set a standard of the character that you and I are supposed to have. Let me give you several quotes and start this. We won't be long at this this morning because there's little ones in the room and, and, and this is not a regular service. But I want to start off with this and then we're going to take it, take it to the nth degree for the next few days. Here's somebody, a man called John Wooden said this. He said, uh, be more concerned with your character than your reputation because your character is what you really are while your reputation is is merely what others think of you. Here's a man called Thomas Paine. He put it this way. Reputation is what men and women think of you. Character is what God and angels know of us. I like it best what D.L. Moody puts it this way. He says, Character 
is what you are in the dark. Another man took that a little bit further and he said this, the measure of a man's real character is what he will do if he knew that he would never be found out. Now that's a whole different ballgame. If you thought nobody would know, nobody sees, and you'll never get caught, what would you do? That is what we're into this morning. Character, good character. And it's not formed overnight. I wish it was, but it's not. It takes weeks, it months, it takes years. It's really created little by little. And it's not even created by what you read from a book or what you watch on television. It's created out of your experiences that you walk through life and how you took a hold of it and how you run with it. I've always looked at the, the man Judas who, who, who sold out the Lord Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Can you imagine? He ran every, every crusade Jesus had, he was there. Every time Jesus said, pull up a chair, sit down on a rock, we're going to talk. And he spoke words of wisdom, words from, from God himself, words of wisdom that would change your life. And Judas sat through all them. Yet, yet, he had a character flaw. There was something in his character he never dealt with. And so one day it brought him down and he sold his friend for 30 pieces of silver. There's another man in the Bible in the Old Testament, a man called Job. And Job was, as we would find out in the scriptures, he was God's choice. He chose. He had, God actually chose Judas, but Judas wouldn't change his character and so he fell. But Job... Job was God's choice. God, God chose him. He chose him as a man that he could point out to society and point out to the enemy itself. He's a man that he found, he said, that he feared God and all his wells. In Job chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there's none like him in all the earth. He's blameless, he's upright, he's fearing God, and he's turning away from evil. God said nothing right there about Job's intellect. Did you get that? He's never mentioned what school he went to, never mentioned his intellect, never mentioned his talents, and never mentioned his, his wealth. Never mentioned them, because those things are of no value to God. You see, Joe, you need to repeat that. He never mentioned his intelligence, he never mentioned his talents, and he never mentioned his wealth, because those threes are insignificant as far as God is concerned. God was only concerned with one aspect, and that was called his character. And he said, you see this man? He has got purity. He's God-fearing. And he is upright. As in the case of the Lord Jesus, it was Job's character. Everybody shout character. It was Job's character, and not his accomplishments, nor not even his ministry, that delighted the heart of God. We need to get that in our thinking. Not your qualifications, not even the size of your ministry, not the size of your church, nothing to do with it. These are all these things that we want. But let me tell you someone, here's what God looks at. He's not judging you by your ministry. He's not judging you by your accolades. He's judging you by your character. And God is looking. In fact, when God goes to test and God tests you, you can never, never overlook this, God tests you. When God goes to test you, He doesn't test you with cancers, with sickness, with heart disease and diabetes. When God goes to test you, he only looks in one area. It's called your character. He doesn't bother with anything else. He just looks to your character. Not how much of the Bible you even know. Not what, with a big Bible or small Bible or, or what translation. He's not even looking at that. He's looking at your character. Because it's your character that will hold you. It's your character. When God looks for a man to boast in, when God goes to promote man, he's boasting in that man. He says, here's a man, here's a woman, have you seen this? And the only trait that God is looking at is one we can all work on and all attain to. It's simply called his character. When he looks for a man or a woman of character, he's looking for those that's blameless or as perfect as you possibly can. There's nobody perfect, but you're doing your best to be doing it right, to be uh, blameless and to be upright to be forthright, to be right there in front of people and live. You, you are behind closed doors the same as when you're in public. There's no difference. There's not one thing here and one thing for a public. No, no, you're not wearing a mask. You're not a hypocrite. This is who you are. What you see is what you get. This is the way I am. This is the way you are. Now, if you're something else and there's something wrong, then it's a character flaw. He said, I want somebody that fears God, fears God, and that hates evil. We, we build churches nowadays that carries none of those weights. They want talented musicians. They, they want the smoke and they want the dazzlers, but they don't produce this. 
And God's not looking at your spotlights. And God's not even looking at the color of the seats. But he's looking at the color of your heart. He's looking at your character. We may have a tremendous reputation among all their believers as being something spiritual. But God knows. He's the one that looks deep inside us all. And he's the one that gives accolades and promotes and gives rewards. He's the one that says, well done, my good and faithful servant. He's the one that looks and measures and weighs up. Here's it is then. Then the most important question, the most important question is not what, what opinion do other people have of my spirituality, but rather what opinion does God have of my spirituality? Can he boast on me? He t- see, he knows. And he gives us time and he works with us. He sends things to help you through. Israel, Israel, when, when God brought uh, uh, 400 years of slavery, 400 years of owning nothing, buying nothing, never going on holidays, no sick pay, no child benefit, 400 years of living like a nobody, a second-class citizen, and God ended it overnight and brought them out, and brought them out. And God says, I'm bringing you into a land that flows with milk and honey. In Deuteronomy, it tells you to get from here to here was a 10-day journey. That's all it took, 10 days. My goodness me, you, you, you wouldn't even go on a cruise for less than two weeks. But here, he said, I'm bringing you out of this, and I'm bringing you over here. And it takes 10 days. But then he said, I can't do it in 10 days because you don't have the character to stand it. Because the first test you hit, you'll fail. Because the first fearful thing, you'll be afraid. And you'll turn on me. So God says, I can't take you the shortcut. I'm going to have to take you the long road. It took 40 years. And I remember thinking to myself, is it going to take 40 years to get Joe Corey from where I used to be to where he needs me to be? Will it take 40? It takes 40 years if you don't straighten your character because God's dealing with your character and that's all. If he can straighten your character to a place where he can trust you, not trust you not to run off and stuff, not to trust you to this, that good times or bad times, you'll still keep your eyes on me and you'll still worship me and you'll still trust me. When you don't know what's going, when you don't know what's happening, when you can't figure it out one way or the other, you won't get all razzled and frazzled and moany and grumpy. No, no, you still worship me because you know you have my best interests at heart. It's called character. Everybody showed character. So God couldn't take them the shortcut through the 10-day journey. He said, I know you, you'd never make it. I know you. Well, no, I, I'm feeling good. You may be feeling good, but there's flaws in your character. And God says, it's going to take me 40 years to get that thing sorted out. So when Satan, when God chose, chose Job, simply not because of his qualifications, not because of his wealth, not because of his good looks and charm and personality, or who he was connected with, or what church he went to, he took him because of character. He scanned the earth looking for somebody who would be perfect and upright, feared God and ensued evil ran from me, but I should have found him as Job. He's my trophy. And the first person that came up on the scene to say, do you think so, was Satan. And God said, have you considered this boy? God said, I'm proud of him. That's mine. I'm proud of him. And when when Satan asked for him personally and asked him, God said, well, you can go so far, but you can't go the whole way. You can't take his life. And he's touched him. He touched his stuff. He touched his stuff. And if you want to be a real place, he touched his material wealth. <laughs> Sounds better if he touched his stuff. Look at somebody saying, get your hands off my stuff. He touched his stuff. So Satan came first of all and touched the building and touched, touched the things that was necessary. But God knew, go ahead if you want to. You can touch that stuff of his. But I know Job. I've seen his character. And no matter what you do, Job will still be standing at the end of it. And God knew that Job's character was strong enough to hold through it. When Job wasn't sure of whether where it was coming from, how it was coming to him, when he wasn't sure of what was coming from, you know what Job says? The Bible says he still bowed his head and he worshipped God. And not at one time did he make an accusation against God. That's called character. That is character. When Satan touched Job's body, 
and he did. They reckoned, because in modern day translations, reckoned he had, he had skin cancer. It was open sores, and he had to scratch him just to get some itch and some relief. And when God, uh, when the enemy touched him, still his character held. His character held. Satan simply just hitting him in several different directions at one time, probing, trying to get through, trying to look for a weakness in his character that he could say, I have him. But couldn't find any. His character stayed strong. When Satan used then, listen to this, he used Job's wife. Even his wife, his wife should have been there holding his hand and saying, you're the man. Come on, I know this is tough days. I know this is rough stuff. And the two of us cried all night, but I tell you, come on, we'll go for a walk and we'll work our way through us. Two, two, two's better than one. Two's meant to be holding it together. And it's his own wife. His own wife. Come to him and said, curse God and die. There's another translation and said, just bless God and then commit suicide. His own wife. Good night, Irene. The reason you married Irene <laughs> was so when you go through tough days, because we all do, we can help each other through the tough times. Everybody has tough days. I got tough days. I got Laura there to help me. Sometimes she's the first to turn around and say, oh, come on. She goes through tough times. I'm the first to turn around and say, come on, you can get through us. We can get through us. And two walks together. But his own wife, his own wife, used by Satan himself to try and bring up. In fact, if you take it right down to the family, the Bible says about the Lord Jesus, the Bible says his family wouldn't even come into the meetings. The Bible says that his own family thought he was mad, and that's about the Lord Jesus, his family. But their character held. And Satan, he even used his friends. His friends come around and said, Job, you're, boy, you must be in the sin whenever all this stuff's got. His own friends is now coming on him. But God says, I, I can handle this. You can handle this, Job, because you've got character to see this thing through. The said of the Lord Jesus says, he was wounded in the house of his friends. See, you, you've not been through anything that the Lord hasn't already been through. He'd been through. He said, I, I, I suffered in the house of my friends. But his character held. And even when Satan attacked using his enemies, using his enemies, the Bible says when they stood in front of him, the, the, the calf is spit on his face. They whipped him around his face. And then they, they made accusations. You know what the Bible says about the character of the Lord Jesus? He didn't slam back. He didn't give off a mouthful. He didn't turn and say, who do you think you are? He didn't do it. He kept his cool. He, he, stood, he stood just looking. The Bible said he remained silent. He only spoke when he had something great to say. And after that, he said no more. That's self-control. That's character. That's not flying off. That's not, some, of you, some of you have got teeth mark on the steering wheel. Because somebody pulled out in front of you on the red lights. I have drove with many as a pastor. Brought picked me and Laura up in the airport. And the man and wife pastor sitting in the front and they're arguing. Just turn around. No, 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 we've got to turn right. Turn. I said, well, turn around. I've seen them hitting the horn with their hand. I've seen one man that man. He, there was, the traffic was real bad. He was thumping the horn. I guess he was, he was scripting. The, he was talking to cars going by. Where do you think you're going? So can I go to preach in this guy's church later on? And I remember he said, well, stop for something to eat. I said, I stop for something to eat. We went in and sat down for something, and we just ordered something like omelets or something simple. He couldn't eat his dinner. It stuck in him here. He had to get up to the bathroom and try to relieve this thing. I said, what is wrong? He says, I don't know. I don't know. He says, oh, my dinner's sticking. I thought it's an any wonder the way you behaved coming down this road. Character. Flying off at the handle. Well, who do they think they are? Well, you stop it now. It's going to take you 40 years. And the look of you, some of you don't have 40 years to spare. You need to control it. I've said it before. Shutteth the mouth. Sip it. You need to learn how to control yourself. Some of you, you turn bright red. You think you're going to lay an egg sideways. Stop it. The only one you're hurting is yourself. You're not impressing anybody. You're not helping anybody. All you're doing is putting more flaws in your character. And when God goes to use some, I got a destiny. You'll never get there because you have so many flaws in your character. Even if he got you there overnight, you'd lose it in a second. Well, I want to be a pastor. You probably wouldn't stick this job for three weeks. Because somebody will come and look in your face. They don't like the way you preach today. You may not be able to handle it. If you've got flaws in your character, 
You can't handle it, believe you me. The enemy of your soul will find ways. He'll probe you till he finds the weakest link and then he'll hit it. So if you don't have the moral fortitude, if you don't have the character that can stand and say, you know, I got, we got more stuff to talk about. This is, this is the introduction. We got some real good stuff. But if you don't have the, the moral fortitude, the Christian belief to walk up and say, you know something? I really was wrong there. I, I'm sorry. Can we start again? Then there's something wrong. There's something wrong. If we don't have that ability to get over the past, if we don't have that ability to put it behind us and say, well, phew, that's yesterday. Let's, let's move along. If we don't have that, if we don't have that, then there's a character flaw. And you're not hurting anybody but yourself. And you're not holding anybody's destiny up but your own. And when your character flaw is there, it removes you from all that God wants you to be. Uh, well, a couple more minutes and I'll finish. But in Galatians chapter 5, and it says, If we walk in the Spirit, we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the lust of the flesh walks against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. They are adultery, fornication, uncleanness. Now it's uses a few big words here. We haven't time to get into this morning. Like here's one, lasciviousness. Then there's idolatry. There's witchcraft. I, I can bring witchcraft down to a better edge. You can, we think about witchcraft as people dancing around a bonfire and shouting all types of runes and crazy stuff. But actually, if you go to the book of Ezekiel, witchcraft is the same as rebellion. Rebellion. So God says to do this. No, I'm not doing that. Rebellion. Bible says it's classed, it's right up the same, right in the same street as witchcraft, and believe you me, rebellion. When God says, go make it right, <laughs> that's rebellion. This exactly carries the same weight as witchcraft. And let me tell you something, it opens demonic doors. It opens demonic doors. And if you think you've got an anger and a temper right now, you'll eat the grapes off the wallpaper one day if you don't get that dealt with. Hatred. Hatred. And, and, and variance, uh, uh, it says wrath, that anger, that anger, and strife, and strife, people's full of strife, sedations, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, reveling, and such like. He says, of which I told you before, and I, and, 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 and I tell you again, he says, of, of such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Not, you're not getting in. He said, you're not going to, if you get into that stuff, you're not getting in. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. But he said, the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, uh, that's all that, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. He says, of them, there's no law to cover them. He said, they are. Now, I'll tell you what, that we know that as a Bible study, we call it the fruit of the Spirit. Let me give it another title. They're strengths of character. That's exactly what that is. That's character strengths right there. And character is what you and I need to work on. The day and hour, I don't care what big a rascal you are, bad-tempered, violent-tempered, full of hatred, full of bitterness. Look at somebody say, they didn't come this morning. The day and hour you give your life to Jesus Christ and you humbly bowed your head and you acknowledged that you were a sinner, couldn't save yourself, and you said, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and save you. At that instant in time, something took place. Bible, we know it as, Bible says, we're born again, we're born anew. There's something took place at that moment of time is called a character change. So you may have been the biggest liar in town. You may have been a rogue and a con artist, full of pride and, and stole right, left, and south. The minute that you give your life to Jesus Christ, there's this new spirit comes on the inside. You're born again. You get a whole new start. You don't have to do the things you used to do. You're new. Look at somebody say, I'm new. That's right. You're a brand new Christian. You've got character now. God put it on the inside of you. If you don't learn how to maintain that, then some of the old stuff will start to come back on top of you again and change you back to where you used to be and then you're back to square one. So it's spending time with Jesus. It's having a secret place with him. It's getting away to decide to do it. It's, it builds character. I'll make a statement and then we're going to close. As a man one time, he took his daughter to the fun fair. Dangerous thing to do in this. You've got a pocket full of money. Fellas will run off and help themselves. Not, not girls, not girls. They, them, them, them little girls, they'll turn around and... 
and say, Daddy, can I have more money? Daddy, can I? They, they want it of you. They want you to go on the merry-go-round on the roller coaster, and man, he's a fearful roller a coaster of sat on. What I didn't want to go, what your daughters want you to do, to <laughs> you're hanging on there. But the dad took his little daughter, a little tiny daughter, and, and she saw the candy floss man, and, and, and she said, I want that. So, so she went over and said, have a big candy floss. And the man whipped that thing around and hold it, this thing as big as the girl's head. You know him candy floss? Put it in her hand, and his daddy, the daddy came up to the little girl and said, said uh, hold on, darling. Do you think you can, you think you can, you think you can eat all that? And she made a statement. She says, Daddy, I'm a lot bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. See, that's character. It makes us bigger on the inside than the outside circumstances. That no matter what comes, no matter what goes, we have the moral and mental fortitude and the character to handle it. And if you can handle what life throws at you, it doesn't stop it from coming, but if you can handle it, God can take you the shortcut so many times that you don't have to walk in circles for 40 years to get where God wants you to be. You can do this. Look at somebody say, you can do this. It's because the Spirit of God wants to come and help you. He wants to change you. Without it, you'll go nowhere. You'll just be, always be that nasty man from table number six. When you could be that dream person at table number four. Could we sit beside you today? Yep. It's your character that draws people. It's your character that draws God. It makes life worthwhile you go to bed at night sleeping and thinking, man, I'm doing okay. You can wake it up in the morning and say, this is a new day. Who am I going to help? Where am I going to go today? No matter. You don't always have to look over your shoulder and say, I wonder what I told him. I wonder what I told her. You don't say a liar always have to be a good liar because you've got to remember what you told the last time. You don't have to think like that anymore. There's a liberty and there's a freedom. There's the ability to say no when everybody else has said yes and not be ashamed of it just to walk away and get on with life. It'll keep you. It'll protect you. It'll watch over you. God put it inside you. It's who you really are. Father, this morning, I thank you that your garden is watching us. You're making something out of us. You have a destiny and a purpose for every single one of us. And we understand this morning, we've got to have the mental and moral fortitude to hold it. We've got to have the character. So God, if there's areas in our life that we need work done, please show it to us that, that we can get this straightened up. We, we will bend, we will buy. If we have to humble ourselves. No matter what it is, we're going that way. We're going to do it. We're going to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. I know formally we're finished, but there is people in here this morning and, and you're, you, you need prayer and you, there's uh, sickness and disease in your body. And for five minutes, if we can take it and just finish this, uh, uh, we're going to ask you to come up rather than us having to walk down to there. Just come up in here this morning. Stand in here. We want to pray for you. Well, Laura's going to pray for you this morning. We're going to pray for your healing. We're going to pray that the pains and aches leaves. We're going to pray that that, that uh, uh, whatever, the diabetes comes back into line, that heart disease begins to leave with you. This is what prayer lines are for. We learn behind the scenes how to stand in the Word, but there's an anointing, a corporate anointing, places, I guess, that deals with stuff. Uh, I did a meeting uh, it was last Friday night, Laura and I was down. She had a long prayer line. But a lady sent me a text during the week, and she said uh, it came from somebody else who was standing in the prayer line. And they said that uh, they, they had it's like cancer or something's going on in their body, but they were in severe pain. And they said they got into the prayer line, and their prayer was in the prayer was, Dear God, you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to do something to help me get through this. And they said that before we ever reached them, before we reached them, the pain had disappeared. They said, now we can't say that we're clear this because we've got to go back to the hospital this week. But let me tell you, if the pain left that quick, it's probably that disease has gone. So this is what we're after. We're going to help you right now. Uh, you may never have come to church like this in your life before. We're not here to offend you, to embarrass you, whatever. You may never come back, and I can't do anything about that. But in this church, we like, to, we like people well and healed. We're going to help you this morning. So if you want to leave your seat, uh, there's no music. And there may be, hey, there's music somewhere. I, I can hear it coming. Everybody chat, I can hear it coming. <laughs> oh, it's hard to get good stuff. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Listen, if you come up real quick, and then church will be over. In, a, in, a, in five, five, ten minutes, church will be over. You'll be on your way, and you can eat your fish and chips or congratulate the young couple at the front, whatever this may be. If there's illness, pains, eggs, sickness, 
barren womb, whatever that may be, that if it's hurting you this morning, then step up here this morning. This won't, we won't embarrass you. We won't call you by name. The cameras are switched off. It's not on. There's no recordings. It's just you. It's just you. We want to help you. Start line up right along here. That's it. Bad, I'm glad to see you. Really good to see you. We believe in our blood.